On this episode, we attend the announcement for the Great American Rail Trail in Washington, D.C. We visit the location where a pedestrian was killed in Bethesda, Maryland. We attend Walk to School Day at Bethesda Elementary. We talk with a blind pedestrian in Alexandria, Virginia. We learn about the Partnership for Road Safety in Tbilisi, Georgia. Finally, in Croatia, Parents in Action is looking at children and walking. Stay tuned. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Ryan Chow, who's president of the Rails to Trails Conservancy. What is the Conservancy? So Rails to Trails Conservancy is a 33-year-old organization, and we helped to create the idea of the rail trail movement, of converting unused railroad corridors into multi-use trails. Since our founding, 23,000 miles of rail trail have been built all across the country. What were you doing here in Washington this afternoon? Today was a fun day in Washington. So this was the launch, the reveal of the route of the Great American Rail Trail, which is a planned 3,700 mile uh, multi-use trail that will go from Washington, D.C. to Seattle, spanning the whole country. What, uh, what's been involved in, in putting something like that together? So it's been an idea that has um, been contemplated by our organization, others, for really 30 years. This idea of something that could be, you could be free from traffic, go coast to coast. But what has really accelerated it has been just the scaling of rail trails around the country. Currently, the route that we selected uh, is more than 52% complete. That was kind of the tipping point for us to decide to really connect all of those trails and make it a seamless route. So what's, uh, what's next? What will it take to, to make it seamless? Yeah, so there's plenty of work ahead. Uh, we're lucky to have many great partners, iconic trails that are, will be hosting the route. The work ahead will really be state by state, going from the planning that we've done to really implementing those connections. That will involve advocacy for funding, that will involve much more detailed planning, uh, and really just bringing a very large coalition of the many folks who want this trail to come together and make their voices heard. And when uh, communities working on, on a rail to trail project and they discover, oh, it's going to be part of this national trail. Uh, what does that do for them? Well, I think we're just starting, so I think we you know, can only predict all that will uh, happen. I think part of it is we've heard from our partner trails that while they are, enjoy providing the great service they do for their communities, this heightened level of interest will increase usership uh, of their trails, something we all want to do to get as many people out there as possible, create new partnerships between trail systems, and for whether it's any of our trail partners or us as an organization, allow us to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves and is an enduring gift to our country. How many people live within a, you know, a short distance of, of the trail? Yeah, so it was pretty exciting in doing the mapping and planning. We, what we found was across the entire trail, there are 50 million people that live within 50 miles of the trail. Some of those, of course, large urban centers, but also people in rural communities that will, I think, have a different kind of asset they haven't experienced before. And in you know, rural communities that have had you know, existing rail trails, uh, the Great Allegheny Passage, the Katy Trail, some other uh, well-used trails. What impact does that have on a, a small community? Well, so some of these towns have been called trail towns, and that's because the rail trails will bring new people, tourism, other visitors, and we've seen in some cases those iconic trails you mentioned, towns really revitalizing. Some of it oriented around those particular visitors of the trails, some simply around just a heightened degree of visibility and civic pride and interest that has really been an amazing booster shot for many of those those trail towns as they're called. And how does uh, the Great American Rail Trail relate to some other existing long distance trails, the East Coast Greenway and, and what else else there is out there? Yeah, so what's very exciting is we're standing 
here, really where the East Coast Greenway, which goes north to south, south to north, but on the East Coast, the Great American Rail Trail, east to west, uh, and this is where they intersect, uh, where they ultimately will. So one thing that's quite exciting is our vision, the vision of many other partners, is that there are iconic trail spines, but that they're part of just an, a whole country connected by trail. So we're excited to, uh, to continue to be great partners with East Coast Greenway. You could take the Great American, then you could take the East Coast uh, Greenway as well. There are also many other terrific trail, hiking trails, other trail systems. What's unique about the Great American is that it would be completely separated from traffic and just based on the gentle grade of rail trails, provides a degree of accessibility that many other trail systems don't afford. And someone who's interested in rail trails, likes rail trails, uh, goes and walks or rides on, on rail trails, uh, what can they do to support this project? So there's a real easy thing to do, is uh, we're looking to uh, enlist one million people to pledge their support for the Great American Rail Trail. So that's number one, is, is pledge the support. Uh, go to a website we're just launching today, greatamericanrailtrail.org, and show that you believe and you want this trail for the country. Uh, that's going to essentially be able to tell civic leaders, policymakers, that there's this kind of momentum to really get behind. That'd be the first one. Secondly, for any of your local trails you enjoy, we always encourage you to uh, support them, whether it's in a volunteer basis or uh, in advocating for more trails in your particular community. This is an iconic trail by itself, but we hope it just accelerates and builds the movement for trails connected anywhere where people need them. We're in Bethesda, Maryland, talking with Miriam Schoenbaum with the Action Committee for Transit. What is the Action Committee for Transit? Uh, the Action Committee for Transit is a grassroots community organization. We advocate for better transit, walking and bicycling in Montgomery County, and basically making the county a better place um, for people to live. What was going on here this morning at this intersection? <coughs> Last month, um, Jennifer DeMauro, uh, who lived right up the road, uh, was killed crossing the road right here. It's a crosswalk where the Bethesda Trolley Trail crosses a basically five lane road with a 40 mile an hour speed limit. Um, if you cross, you can push a button and yellow flashing lights come on. This is supposed to alert drivers to the fact that you're crossing and they have to stop. Um, as we know from crossing here, many drivers do not stop. The driver uh, that, that hit Jennifer DeMauro did not stop and she was killed. Is this a, a common problem? Uh, yeah, in here in particular, um, it's a common problem because it's an uncontrolled crosswalk across a multi-lane road. Um, there's actually a technical term for it, which is a multiple threat intersection. That's when one driver in one direction stops, but the other driver next to that car doesn't stop and hits the pedestrian. Uh, in general, countywide, it is a problem of drivers not stopping in crosswalks and basically driver speeds being very high because of the way the roads are designed. And earlier, earlier this morning, before this demonstration, there's another demonstration over on Old Georgetown Road. What was it about? In that case, uh, Jake Castle, who was 17, was bicycling from his house about three blocks to the Y to go swimming. He was bicycling on the sidewalk because it's a six or seven lane road where people routinely drive over 40 miles an hour. So the sidewalk is the safest place to ride, but the sidewalk is really terrible. It was, it's about three feet wide. It's right next to the road. It's got signs right in it. It's got a fire hydrant in it. It had garbage cans on it. Uh, Jake hit something in the sidewalk um, and fell into the road off his bike and was killed by the person who was unfortunate enough to be driving right when um, 
Jake fell off his bike into the road. The sidewalk, again, is the responsibility of the State Highway Administration, and it's a terrible sidewalk. It's a design and infrastructure problem. When you were reading off names this morning, what were the names you were reading? So that was a list of the 47 people who have been killed in Montgomery County while walking or biking or using a wheelchair since the County Council adopted their policy called Vision Zero in February 2016. So basically in three and a half years, 47 people have been killed in this county of one million people while walking or biking or using a wheelchair. What, uh, what were some of the ideas that people had that might bring down that casualty rate in the future? Well, specifically at the two places we were this morning, um, you need to have better, safer sidewalks and you need to have protected bike lanes. Uh, here on Tuckerman Lane, again, you need to have um, better sidewalks and protected bike lanes. And we also asked for an actual red light at this crossing uh, because drivers generally will stop at a red light and then people will be able to cross safely. In general, though, in the county, it's a problem that for the past 70 years, the county has been prioritizing getting places fast by car over getting places safely on foot or on a bike or in a wheelchair, and that really needs to change or people are going to keep getting killed. We're in Bethesda, Maryland at Bethesda Elementary School, and we're talking with Mary Kahan, who's vice president of the PTA. What was going on here this morning? Well, today was our international walk to school day, and so we encouraged all children to walk, if possible, with their families to school. And afterwards, we actually had a community building event. We had a coffee with uh, parents and then a few local councilmen, uh, as well as some other representatives and some other volunteers. Why is Walk to School Day important? Well, it's a great opportunity for encouraging kids to do, and families, quite frankly, their caregivers, to do additional physical activity. Um, it's also really important because we're very focused on making sure that kids know how to get to school safely, uh, how to make sure that they um, follow the crosswalks and things like that. And also, it's a great community building event. Everyone feels good when they walk to school together. And some places, they make a big to do about it, they gather someplace else and walk together in a parade. You were a little more key, low key than that. Yes, well we have a number of kids who do walk to school every day. Um, we do have bussers, um, which, and taking the bus is actually great because it does cut down um, on using lots of different cars, so that is also a very good thing as well. Um, but we just really wanted to focus on community. We wanted to focus on getting people out there, um, you know, having people feel good. And as I said, you know, we do have a lot of kids who walk on a, on a daily basis. So this was mostly just getting out some information and making everyone aware that, um, you know, walking can be a great activity, um, you know, great for your health, great for your body, and a great community building as well. And if you have, you know, some children that are close enough that perhaps they could walk to school, but their parents choose to drive them, uh, what would it take to get them to actually walk? You know, I, I have to say, I'm not sure about the demographics of, of whether people actually do that. I, I don't think there's a lot of that. We really have um, most of the people who live, as we, you can see, we're down here in, um, you know, an urban area, you know, urban suburban area. Um, right across the street, we have a number of buildings, and um, most of those children do walk to school. Um, as I guess you sort of gave me a softball one, because the truth is, is if, if people are taking a car, um, this is a great opportunity for them to try walking and realizing how great it is. It's very close, it's easy, um, you know, it, it's very safe. And, um, you know, so this hopefully may go a long way towards encouraging anyone who does take the bus or does drop off their child in a car that maybe they in the future will walk. We're in Alexandria, Virginia, talking with Jeremy Grandstaff, who's a uh, management consultant and a member of the Alexandria Bike Bed Committee. Hey John. What is the committee? So basically the Alexandria Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee um, originally started as 
uh, a, just a committee itself that was working to improve the streets for people who bike and walk um, in Alexandria. Um, I believe we are actually in the process of incorporating as a nonprofit. Um, we work closely with WABA and other um, groups around the region to um, ensure that we have a walk-friendly, bike-friendly region. What, uh, what sort of challenges do pedestrians face in Alexandria? So Alexandria itself is a pretty accessible um, city. We have four transit stops, uh, four or five transit stops. We're right below the airport. Um, so uh, for the most part, it is figuring out how you get that first mile or last mile of your trip done. Um, so uh, the city has had some challenges um, with making sure that we've got um, uh, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure that's good and that is going to uh, allow for people to mo move around the city safely. Um, I think one of the bigger challenges that we're dealing with right now is we're piloting a scooter program and in that pilot we're having to figure out um, how scooters fit into the transportation picture and what that looks like. Um, when should they be on the sidewalk? When shouldn't they be on the sidewalk? That type of thing. I would say one of the other bigger challenges is just sidewalk infrastructure in general. Um, I live uh, behind me and to my left here. And so, um, well, past the gas station, of course, I don't live at the gas station. Um, but they have, um, you know, some sidewalk repairs that really need to be done. And it's a matter of helping the city prioritize that. Um, this is the west end of Alexandria where I live. The east end is where you have Old Town and some of the older communities that are um, more dense and they have uh, better infrastructure there. I think sometimes they get a higher priority because of that infrastructure and density. What? Uh... What can you tell us about this intersection we're standing at? So this intersection um, is uh, Duke Street and South Pickett Street. And so um, one of the interesting things about this in, uh, in intersection and the way that it's designed is we have um, really just a normal light. You've got people making right-hand turns on red. You've got, uh, if you're crossing South Pickett back here over my shoulder, um, and you're trying to stay on Duke, you're basically dealing with people turning right on red um, in two different places, as well as two different left-hand turn lanes that are making turns as well. So it gets uh, a little tricky as you um, navigate that infrastructure. Uh, and the way that the light is set up, you basically are challenged by the car um, to cross the street. What uh, safely? <laughs> yeah. What what can be done in an intersection like this to to make it a little easier for? So I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I think what you could try to do is um, maybe change the light a little bit so that the left hand turn lanes go and then everybody else goes. You could also have an all stop. Um, where pedestrians could cross both streets at the same time. I think um, if it was up to me, I would all stop all right-hand turns on red, quite honestly. Because if you were to do that, that would at least focus the challenge on the center of the street and not when you go into the street. And quite honestly, as a person who was hit by someone coming down South Pickett and turning right um, because they did it turn right on red and I was trying to cross. Um, that's, that would have uh, saved me some injuries. Um, I think they could also put in actual audible signals, um, especially if they decided to go with the all stop um, because uh, I think it'd just make it safer for everybody to cross if they're actually told, you know, now it's safe to cross, 
um, South Pickett. Uh, we have an intersection down South Pickett to the right, which is, um, I think it's South Pickett and Cameron Station Boulevard. And they just put in an awesome audible signal down there um, that is a really good model for what would work for this intersection. We're talking with Mariam Kukava from Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains. What's the NGO you work for? I work at the NGO Partnership for Road Safety. Um, we work uh, to support safe mobility in Georgia, to uh, promote walking, cycling and public transport, also to improve the situation regarding road safety, um, ge uh, generally regarding fatality, to um, reduce fatality and injury rate in Georgia. Uh, we work um, in terms of uh, transport, um, for everything to improve every detail regarding transport. Um, that's all. Has Georgia seen a rapid increase in motorization, the number of automobiles in the last few decades? Yes, it's um, really improved. Um, increasing numbers of uh, cars, especially in the capital of Georgia. Um, about um, um, one million people live in Georgia and uh, half uh, number uh, are car rate. What, uh, what are conditions like for pedestrians in Georgia? If I wanted to walk around Tbilisi, what are conditions like? Unfortunately, the situation uh, regarding pedestrians' mo uh, mobility is very poor. Uh, infrastructure is not uh, accessible for pedestrians, especially for people with disabilities. Um, pavements is not in good um, conditions, and um, infrastructure is poor, uh, shortly to say. And how does your organization work to, to try to improve things? Uh, you know, you, wh where do you start? First of all, we're trying to raise awareness of society. For example, uh, from raise awareness of children from kindergarten to um, schools. And um, we try also uh, to advocate uh, for, so for um, improving the situation regarding um, pedestrian mobility. Um, um, and we have already made some changes. For example, we, uh, we we were advocating in the last years, we are advocating to make safe school zones and in some places uh, we um, the government, um, the city hall at Bil of Tbilisi, made decision made decision to cross uh, to paint um, zebras in some school zones and uh, reduce speed limits too, and something like that. So, what are you doing here in Switzerland this week? What are you hoping to to learn? Uh, um, I am the guest of this event and we are going to implement a project regarding uh, safe school systems and uh, um, we get very um, big knowledge regarding uh, the experience of Switzerland which is one of the best performing country regarding uh, pedestrian safety uh, and uh, I'm really impressed. Uh, I know. What are you going to do with what you learn this week when you get home next week? I will uh, share experience of Switzerland in Georgia with my, uh, first of all, with my um, organization members and after um, uh, with uh, members of, uh, we are actively working with uh, members of government, with parliament members, so I will share the experience of Switzerland to them too to make some changes in Georgia and improve situations regarding pedestrian safety and general road safety. We're talking with Italina Benchevic. Where are you from and what's the NGO that you belong to? Uh, we are from Croatia, a small country in Europe. Uh, we are called uh, Parents in Action 
in Croatian, and our, our abbreviation is Roda, that means stork. So we are, uh, uh, we are uh, making uh, programs about uh, parent, uh, parenthood, uh, birth, uh, pregnancy, and child and childhood. You got a couple of projects going on. Tell me about them. Yes, we have many projects uh, going on, and uh, we have been uh, doing one program for a very long time. It's been uh, 15 years now, uh, called uh, Safely in a Car Seat. And after this 15 years of uh, working with parents and children and working together with police force, uh, we have many, many, many uh, activities in that project. Uh, and uh, after 15 years, we, um, we have uh, seen that uh, there are too many children that are driving in cars. There are, there are no pedestrians. Uh, there are no children walking to school. Uh, parents think they, uh, that's too dangerous. So uh, we decided to take an act again and uh, to make some kind of project concerning uh, children as pedestrians. And uh, we saw an op opportunity here in the Swiss Creation Corporation program. Uh, and we, uh, we have made a project that is called Take a Break, but uh, break we, uh, yes. as a, yeah. Uh, and um, we are here in Switzerland to learn and uh, to see uh, some of their good projects and maybe to try to implement them back at home. Have you seen some good ideas this week? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, good ideas. Uh, we have uh, seen their education uh, and it, 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 it's been a very, very wonderful experience and I really hope that we can do just a little bit for the, for the for the start just like that something like that visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org